Good morning. Good day. You're with Captain Jan Miles of the Pride of Baltimore Two. We're for coffee with and uh, Jeff Crosby, Chief Mate Jeff Crosby, behind the camera as producer. And we're in the aft cabin of Pride of Baltimore Two. Uh, we have uh, a uh, an octant uh, here for uh, a little bit of decoration back here. Uh, the story behind this octant, I think the old Pride of Baltimore had it, but it was shipped home before the boat returned home. Mm. So I think that's the story behind this octant. Um, sad to say, it's never been written about, so I don't have any way of reminding myself. So it could be apocryphal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, as stories sometimes are. Uh, well, good morning, everyone. Uh, just a reminder, if you have any questions throughout this uh, period, please post them in the comments, and we will address those as the episode goes on. I have some uh, comments uh, from the last coffee with Captain's uh, uh, session that we didn't quite get to. So I'm going to start off with a, a, a little more technical question. Um, do we have GMDSS? Um, so Captain Miles, do you want to explain what GMDSS is and uh, whether or not we have it? Sure. GMDSS, the Global Marine and Duress and Distress Safety System. Uh, it's a... Uh, globalized process due to the the um, uh, ability to have digital information transmitted over analog signal so satellite um, uh, radio waves and horizontal radio waves being single sideband and VHF there was a time when transmitting data was a bit tricky but when that was resolved search and rescue global perspective uh, uh, international search and rescue suddenly realized that the there was a chance to reduce false alarms and false calls due to changing all the communication to the written word through digitalization uh -huh. if they could do that then they could reduce, in their mind, they could reduce false alarms. So uh, the Global Marine and Distress Safety System was established. So when you have equipment that matches that, the VHF uh, film, uh, uh, has a, uh, these days, for some time now, digital select calling, that's a digitalized process, um, adapting that to the single sideband. Then when it comes to satellite, all of that's basically digital. Anyway, it started yeah. out that way. So in Marsat C, so they built a framework of in overlapping interconnection whereby all communication could be done digitally. So there's automatic information. For instance, if you hit the button on a radio or a satellite uh, transceiver, that button establishes that there's a problem they don't define the problem, although there are some select. There is a way of selecting a definition, a description of a problem, uh -huh. but it includes the ship's position, includes the ship's speed, which is all data that is connected to these devices and then transmitted. So, within VHF range, other vessels, if it's a a mayday kind of transmission of hitting that button, uh, everybody in the zone will get the position, will get course and speed as well as identity because that's where the digitalization come in. It could all be packaged up in a ready-to-go scenario. Sure. If you have more time, you can select the emergency, fire, uh, 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 flooding, and a variety of others. So uh, that's the GMDSS system, and it's a, a not an insignificant learning process for certification. It's a couple of weeks worth of uh, classroom time and testing. Um, but in the so all the commercial vessels require uh, those that are going international uh, require being GMDSS compliant and Pride is great. Uh, what what other uh, things do we have that kind of complement GMDSS when it comes to communication uh, layers? Uh, communication layers. Well, <clears throat> the advancement of satellite communication into much smaller. Into continue in, in smaller antennas, but having the ability to maintain telephone talk capability, uh -huh. which then encourages also the it carries also the ability to do email with no attachment. 
So um, there's a, a number of systems out there. Um, uh, for us, we're using uh, Iridium, but we're using this thing called Iridium Go. Yeah. And the interesting thing about that is, is it also incorporates the business of being able to do SMS stuff. So we can just do text back and forth to shore. Which is um, real simple. Kind of simplifies that, the yeah. whole process. Yeah. And it's also in, uh, interesting in that they use a Wi-Fi interconnection from the transceiver, which is going to the satellite, to a smart device. So you can be unattached to the transceiver and they are able to send up a message and get a message back. Mm -hmm. So there's a certain flexibility that we're enjoying because of that. And it's not overly expensive. Um, certainly it's going to be more expensive than cellular communication, but when you're out of range... Yeah, what do you do with that? Yeah, so right. it's, it's basically like a, a satellite uh, hotspot, right. uh, which is kind of cool. Yeah. Uh, good morning, everyone. For those of you just joining us, uh, we have uh, Captain Jan Miles in front of the camera, Chief Mate Jeff Crosby behind the camera. Uh, if you guys have any questions as we're uh, answering some of the ones we already have, feel free to chime in in the comments and we'll make sure to get those answered. Uh, we have a qu question in from uh, Greg Bauer. Uh, how long does it take to traverse the Welland Canal? Well, we've had a wide range of experiences with that. Um, commercial vessels are served by a first come first serve system. However, in the case of Pride of Baltimore, in order to keep costs contained, we are categorized as a recreational vessel. Mm -hmm. And so we do not get served first if there's crowding, if there's a, a, a great deal of crowding. Sure. So we've had as little as less than 12 hours on the Welland, upbound or downbound, and that's between Lakes Ontario and uh, Lake Erie. Um, we've also had huge stay at anchor or stay tied to the dock delays. Uh, last year, um, there was a significant manpower problem. Uh -huh. They didn't have dock line handlers on hand, uh, and they have to book ahead in order to get them. The, trans, the whole welling system is, go, well, the whole locking system is going through a transition of trying to automate so that big ships don't require line handling. Uh -huh. And so the boats are getting locked in by a vacuum system that rises, uh, clamps to the side of the ship and then rises and falls so the ship's not moving around inside the lock. Well, we're not shaped that way. Pride's not shaped in any kind of way that a vacuum can work on. Yeah. And so we have to do lines. So they have to book ahead. We wound up with a great deal of delay going upbound in um, early July last year. I think we had an anchor of 24 hours. We're tied to the dock for 24 yeah, hours. It was 28 yeah, uh, so. when, I, when I counted. <laughs> but, once, <laughs> but once you start moving, then it's between, I think we've actually been as low once we get moving as low as eight to 10 hours to actually transit. That's pretty quick, yeah. 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 Uh, what are some other lock systems? Uh, in order to get to the Welland, you have to go through the St. Lawrence Seaway. Right, so we'll uh, go that? around Nova Scotia, through the Gulf of St. Lawrence, around the Gas Bay, and then make approach to uh, Quebec City, and then uh, to uh, Montreal, and then the lock system begins at Montreal and you're going up past what used to be the rapids, or rather still is the rapids, but it's a system to go around the rapids, and then into Lake Ontario at the Thousand Islands. You're, the last lock is just before the Thousand Island area, uh, and then you go into, uh, and that's the top of the St. Lawrence River as it's fed from Lake Ontario. Then you cross the length of the Lake Ontario, and then there's the Niagara Escarpment, that requires a, a rather closely connected series of locks to climb over 300 feet between the two lakes. And then there's one more lock system, and that's between the twins of Lake Michigan, Lake Huron, and Lake Superior. You're up the St. Mary's River, going up to, to Sault Ste. Marie, um, spelt differently on both sides of the border, yeah, but there's one. Well, there's a series. Of, there's one lock, but it's been replaced a number of times over the years, um, and so there's one lock to go through there. What's the, what's the what's the difference, just experience-wise, between going through the Welland Canal versus going through the Sioux locks? Oh, 
It's a cakewalk with a suit. <laughs> You're not changing la altitude that much, interestingly enough. Yeah. Uh, I think it's like, I don't know, it's just not that much. I can't remember now. But it's a very long lock. They have the thousand footers going through there. Yeah. Those vessels are too big to go through the Welland and the lower locks of the St. Lawrence. So they're trapped, they're embayed in a sense. Um, and uh, so you also get a great deal of ease. And also the turbulence fa factor of filling uh, a lock is you just don't feel it at all. Whereas in the lower locks of the St. Lawrence and the Welland lock, that's very turbulent. All of them are very turbulent, different turbulences, but particularly the Welland is very, very turbulent because they're loading the of water from one side at the bottom, and that creates a zigzag of water crashing against the wall. So at the top, it's coming off the wall and pushing the vessel onto one side. It's a chosen system. There's a, a, a rationale for it. Well, with prize underwater shape being shallow in the bow, deep in the stern and with her main channels being amidships she tends to pivot like a seesaw on her main rigging uh -huh. so there are certain situations where we can have the stern pinned and the bow quite a bit far off so um, we've had to figure out how to uh, to eliminate the damage risks and we get pressured right on so we're using a skid system on the channel and then another skid system, both on the fore channel and, and, and the stern, to allow for the fact that we can't fight that. Once she turns her stern into the wall, we're not gonna be able to pull back on the bow line as a spring line and make that not happen as we're rising. We're rising 40 to 50 feet, sometimes 55 feet. Yeah. So there's just no way to keep up with that. So we have to create the skid system. So. Um, the, the St. Mary is just, we don't have that at all. It's great. Yeah, yeah, that is great. Uh, kind of continuing the, the conversation about locks. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, if you're just joining us, we have Captain Jan Miles in front of the camera, uh, Chief Mate Jeff Crosby, and we're in a conversation about locks and riverways. Uh, when it comes to the Chesapeake Bay, Delaware Canal, um, how often do we use that, and what's that experience like? Well, it's pretty regular. If we're making... Uh, a move to the Atlantic to go northeast, mm -hmm. we'll uh, use the uh, Chesapeake and Delaware Canal, the C and D. Yeah. Um, and uh, there's no lock. There's a bit of current more at the Delaware end than at the Chesapeake end. Um, <clears throat> so uh, uh, at the Chesapeake end, it just comes in and out. In the case of the Delaware end, while it's going in and out of the jetties at that end, the eastern end of the lock, uh, rather the canal, there is the flood and ebb of the Delaware River. So you get a cross and it hits a T. And at certain times it's all pretty sublime, but at most of the time one is doing a rapid amount of movement either in or out, while the other one is doing a rapid amount of movement, water movement uh, up and down. And it's, it just creates a, a twist. You know, sure. if, you're, and if you're caught by surprise by it, then you're surprised. But if you know it, then the helmsman just struggles. Yeah. Uh, what, what's different uh, navigation-wise and vessel movement-wise uh, going through rivers and locks versus just plain, you know, sailing around the bay or sailing around even one of the lakes? Well, it, it, depending upon the, uh, the cross dimension and the depth related to the cross dimension, if you have a favorable wind, you can run a channel mm. quite and sail. Otherwise, you're motoring because you can't sail in line with the depth, the orientation of the, the clear water of the channel or, the, or if it's not a commercial area, it's just adequate depth, but it's lined along the, the length of it. For instance, the, um, there are a number of rivers here in the Chesapeake Bay that are not commercial. And while they may have marks, there's no dredging going on. So the Chester River, which we go up to Chestertown quite often, that mean, and it's a very meandering river, then, then what's happening is, is we're, we're able to sail some of it under certain circumstances uh, when we have the time or not on a, on a tight timeline, and we've done so. We've done the whole river downwind with a southwesterly between the bay and um, um, Chestertown. We had to tack in the lower horseshoe area by Kent Island, but then once we'd reached around that loop that is the horseshoe bend at, near the mouth, 
then it's all reach, jibe and jibe and reach and jibe and jibe. We've never actually had a circumstance of timing to sail back out again. Uh -huh. um, so what happens is, is you just motor when you can't can't align with the depths that are available. So yeah. in the case of the Delaware, we've had some tremendously good sailings um, because the wind has been fair. So we recently came back from the Great Lakes last year and we had a northeasterly breeze, east northeasterly, and uh, so we were sailing down from the northeast and then we went through the entrance of the Delaware uh, Bay and jibed over and had a roaring sail up all the way up to the, the bend that is uh, the first significant bend, which is where the nuclear power station is, just ahead of going into the C&D Canal. And we just dropped sail because there's no wind at that point. And we dropped sail and motored on along our way. So it's the, the differences are the tightness of piloting, the, the mm -hmm. need to stay in adequate depth water. And we won't always stay in a dredge channel if there's adequate depth outside, because sure. that way we don't get into this conversation of what are our intentions when it comes to a commercial vessel with a pilot on board is wondering about that sailboat and what are they going to do next. And yeah. so if well, we can demonstrate that we're staying outside, we don't often have to have a conversation. Uh, what what is dealing with traffic like in in some of these more confined waterways? Uh, well, it's a matter of attention to detail uh, and always has been, but with the aid of the automatic uh, indicating system, which is AIS, that this vessel transmits its location, its name, its course and speed, it also transmits where it's coming from and where it's going, not always, but quite often, you can see graphically on the, an electronic chart what's going on. You also can t pipe that information into your radar and you can see a bird's eye view of what's around you within the range of the radar setup. Um, <clears throat> but with pilotage and their concerns about smaller tonnage, there's often a radio conversation that will go on. Uh -huh. And you'll hear that on a selected channel. In the East Coast, they typically use channel 13 for bridge to bridge communication. And it's between pilots of commercial vessels, just verifying that the plan that they see unfolding, the obvious or the state of the right kind of thing is just gonna be confirmed. But they're also looking to talk to other traffic if they're in doubt. Yeah. And uh, so uh, 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 yachts will not always monitor two channels, channel 16 or channel 13. We do. Um, uh, we find it convenient to do that, so it's pretty easy to respond to a radio call. So, are any of the the sea uh, seaways um, monitored? Well, there's traffic systems, traffic control systems. Okay. They're all. Uh, it's called VTS, Vessel Traffic Service or System, uh, and those are uh, uh, systems that got developed in terms of 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 traffic security as well as national security some time ago. Sure. Um, they've been aided by these electronic overlays. So now at first it was visual, then it was radar aided. Now it's GMD, uh, excuse me, AIS and radar uh, abled, enabled. And so um, you have a highway that's imprinted on the chart um, that you go along for upbound traffic, downbound traffic. One of the b broader systems that we're familiar with is the St. Lawrence Seaway Vessel Traffic Service System. Mm -hmm. And up around Gaspé is when it begins, if you're going into the west, and you can be 20, 30 miles away from any other vessel and still you're involved in this traffic system. But um, it's uh, it, in tighter situations, New York City Harbor has a vessel traffic service system. And we, we we communicate with them by radio uh, uh, when we're in their zone. And that's the East River, the Hudson River, below a certain point, all basically around the lower part of Manhattan and, um, and all of it down to sea to the pilot station uh, north of Sandy Hook. Oh, cool. Um, kind of wrap up our, our uh, locks, riverways conversation. Um, the vessel has been through the Panama Canal. How, oh, does, yeah. how does that... Uh, differ than uh, the St. Lawrence Seaway, the CND, um, those types of things? It's significant differences in administrative. Okay. There's a great deal of, of um, 
a formality with regards to being coming registered for the Panama. Uh, and there's a very complicated process of getting measured for fee for going through. Uh, and every single vessel is required to have a pilot. There is no navigating on your own, so you will have a pilot. And another difference is, is those pilots are covered by an insurance that puts them in complete command of the vessel. Oh, wild. That's the only pilot, Jerry, I'm familiar with that has that. So every other pilot you ever meet is there as an advisor. Uh -huh. And while they do have responsibilities, their legal responsibility is not the legal decision on the ship. The legal decision on the ship is the responsibility of the captain. Yeah. But in the case of the Panama, that actually transfers to the pilot. So the captain becomes the advisor to the pilot. And uh, so these nuances are not significant. Um, and it's just that it's more time consuming to get set up. Uh -huh. uh, you, if you arrive without uh, setting it up ahead of time, you'll be a couple of weeks maybe setting up for when you'll transit because it's also a busy place. There's, there's a, there was a time when it was one way uh, each way. Now with the modification of Panama, it's now two way all the time. Uh, but there's a, so anyway, there's a lot of setup. Then when it comes to going through a lock, they're big locks. There's not a lot of turbulence. Um, however, they like to use locomotives with wires to hold the vessel in place. Mm. And the least amount of tension for them to slip their clutches is in the order of 20,000 pounds. Oh, wow. So yeah. you t a boat like Pride would be literally torn apart. Yeah. So they have to hand walk these lines. So that means four individuals, two on one side, two on the other, because they like to middle mount you in these locks. They don't do a wall side. All these other locks, in the case of the North American locks here, the, the Welland, uh, the St. Lawrence, and, and St. Mary's, they're all you tie to one side and rise yeah. and fall. But in the case of the Panama, they like to put you in the center. And so as you move through subsequent locks, if they're, there's a mixture of back-to-back -back lock basins and then single lock basins. If they're back-to-back, -back, you're going to have to have a crew on the walls that then will walk. So you'll ease off the lines. They'll go a hand line. You'll bring back your lines back in. Their hand lines, will, so they don't have a lot of weight to carry. Yeah. And then you move a thousand feet or whatever it is. And they'll also put more than one vessel in a lock. This the American system, or rather the North American systems, shy away from that. They'll do it, but it's much more common in the Panama. So if they can fit more than one vessel, so if it's a small vessel, you're behind the big vessel. So when the vessel goes, big vessel starts up, you're in the wash. Yeah, of the prop that could be because, a little bit tricky. Well, it's just something to be aware of. Yeah. I mean, you, you're still tied up. They won't loose you until there's clearance, and then you do this business of hand walk in. Yeah. Uh, I got a question from, from Robert Wheeler. Good morning, Robert. Is there a minimum speed to be maintained in the canals? Is there a maximum speed? There are. In the case of the St. Lawrence and the Welland, yes. There's, uh, I don't recall a minimum. Yes, there is a minimum. I'm more familiar with the maximums. We don't usually have a problem with either one. Mm -hmm. But last year up in the Great Lakes, because of so much runoff coming from the previous winter, the water levels were, had risen so much in the lakes that downstream they were having flooding problems. And this meant opening up some of the dams to have more water pass through. And that created higher currents in certain locations. And that created navigation problems for the pilots. Because if you get a 800 foot vessel or a 700 foot vessel and you're going around a bend and there's an increase of current because there's a dam on one side just upstream and it's dumping water, how do you deal with the fact that the bow is in one current, the stern's in another current, and it's twisting the vessel? And do you have enough width in the river to deal with that for the amount of power that you have for these vessels? So they were saying you had to have a minimum speed. And it was a pretty high speed. You had to have a minimum, I think, of six knots at, at some point. It wasn't hard for us to maintain. Uh, no, no, eight knots. Eight knots. Eight yeah. knots, that's which, right. Which was kind of borderline. Yeah, borderline <laughs> for us because we'd be consuming a lot of fuel is what the problem was. Yeah, we'd get there, but what's the cost? Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, <coughs> pardon me. Uh, 
So it became evident to me that the biggest problem was the pilots didn't know how to handle smaller vessels. They don't have a lot of familiarity with smaller vessels. And so if they were required to get aboard a pretty short boat, 100, 150 boat, they weren't 150 foot boat, they weren't familiar with the maneuverability. Mm -hmm. So they were quite concerned with losing control of a vessel that was doing say six knots through the water in a big current when it was 100 feet versus being in a 700 foot boat that could only do six, seven knots. That's when they had, that's when they would have had this huge problem of the bow being deflected or being shoved to the side when it going downstream. So that was a lot of conversation with some of the tall ships going upbound because a few of them weren't going to make eight knots. But they were also very maneuverable, so they weren't going to have a problem. And so there was a lot of tension at first, but uh, once the pilots grasped that as the vessels got really, really short, it wasn't that big of a problem. Mm. They relented. Yeah. Uh, well, to kind of shift gears here, uh, this is a question that, that comes up uh, pretty frequently, um, especially when people find out that, that Pride has sailed all over the world. Uh, what's it like crossing an ocean, and how fast? How fast can you cross the Atlantic Ocean? How fast can you cross the Pacific Ocean? Um... We have, because we're in the a business of promising where we're going to be by a certain time, we have a metric that we use to advance plan. Mm. So we have I polished it down to two metrics rather than just a single one. So our coastal navigation plan is 110 miles a day. And then an additional calendar day that represents the business of departure is somewhat after midnight being we wait for dawn and arrival is somewhat before sunset, meaning we're doing a public relations arrival. So in the case of open water transit, we use 130 miles a day. And uh, we established, therefore, the departure day and the arrival day. And whether we run ahead of schedule in the middle of the leg is a just advantage to the, to the ship. The captain can work with the crew in terms of maintenance and time off. Um, so we're talking 21 days for roughly the 3,000 when we've gone between Baltimore, Maryland, Baltimore, Ireland. Uh, we've done it in 17. Okay. And weirdly, we underway time across the Atlantic has almost stuck on 17. <laughs> um, <laughs> we typically go, have gone typically mo most of the time in the spring. So we're talking April, May. Uh, our first transit that I experienced with the Zill boat in 85, 1985. We routed through uh, Bermuda and routed through the Azores before going to Ireland. Um, but I remember how the jet stream location had a lot to do with our weather. When we came out of Bermuda, we were advised to go pretty much directly north for 300 miles to get to a latitude near New York where we pick up wind. And the reason why was because there was a sort of an Atlantic Bermuda high. Oh, okay. Being a, a clockwise rotation, there was no wind to the east. Mm -hmm. So visually thinking, I was imagining we'd go east from Bermuda. But because of the weather pattern, because of the high pressure, because of the jet stream and all these things combined, we wound up sailing north and before we could sail east. And her fuel quantity was limited and so we really had to sail most of the time in the case of the second boat it's true saying we don't have the fuel for crossing but we also planned the general non-stop plan of going to ireland out of the mouth of the chesapeake bay uh -huh. but then how we would go would depend upon the jet now we've left the chat mouth of, we've left the chesapeake bay in 90 and in 96 in 2000 um, and 2005 uh, and each time they've been um, uh, not so much 2000 but certainly 2005 we left in the early part of the year and the jet stream was in wildly different locations north latitude uh, mid latitude and that has had an effect we came out of Pan uh, out of the mouth of the bay the first time in 90 and we went northeast Mm. And uh, we had a big gale, made a lot of miles, wound up approaching um, uh, Newfoundland and uh, worrying about ice. 
and before we could go east. Uh, in, um, in 96, we had a northeaster on the coast with lows right off the North Key. So we came off, it wasn't super strong, but it was been around a while. So we came out and we waited a day or two in Norfolk actually, and then finally got a departure. And we wound up going Southeast with the Northeaster and then getting ready to pass by Bermuda, we had a reason to delay, uh, a weather reason as much as anything. So we stopped in Bermuda for 18 hours, waited for a low to go by, picked up a southwester, because it had been easterly, then southeast, then south. As soon as it went south, we upped anchor, hauled out. And we had um, seven, five days, seven days of uh, southeast, uh, southwest, then west, and then northwest roaring across the Atlantic, uh, mid-Atlantic. And so it's, 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 you make a plan to cross, but then you always modify based on the weather at the time. Yeah, is there uh, times of year that are more favorable for ocean crossings, especially the, the, the Atlantic? Uh, if you're going from uh, east to west, generally speaking, it's about the intensity of weather. Uh -huh. So if you make it um, after May, let's call it June, July, August, you're talking about less chance of having weather systems violent beyond, higher than force eight. Um, and the jet stream tends to be a little bit further north, so you get to, to sail a little bit more directly. Um, in, the, uh, in the late season, you got to wonder about hurricanes. In the early season, you're just dealing with the fact that a low pressure might be pretty intense. Now, you navigate according to the, it's recommended that you navigate according to the jet stream. If you yeah. stay at or below the jet stream, then you're not likely to see storm force winds greater than force eight. But if you're, at, uh, if you're above, maybe just under, I can't remember the dividing line, but certainly above, then you're likely to run into some storms that could go to force nine, 10 and above. So that's a and, general and why, rule. Why is that? Well, the low pressures are, are affected by jet streams, and, and that effect can create intensity. Uh -huh. So, so the, gr the, the, the increasing strength of a low can be driven by a jet stream, uh -huh. and, and so proximity. So if you're south of the jet, you're not in a situation where the low that's south of the jet is being driven or affected by the jet to start to intensify rapidly. There's a so-called chimney effect. The low is spinning on the ground, on the surface. It comes under a jet that's doing 100 miles plus an hour up high, and there's this drafting quality that, that has been described. Kind of gets sucked up there. Yeah. Well, that draws in the low into uh, intensification. So it also steers the direction of the low to some degree. And so, so when you're south of the jet, you don't get that rapid intensification to the degree that you will get it if you're uh, north of the jet. Uh, and so uh, it's a guidance system. You can't always outrun it. Sure. The jets yeah. meander yeah. while easily forecast. If you monitor it, it should be doable. Um, so uh, uh, we've had crossings uh, at latitude near Hatteras all the way across the Azores. We've had crossings going parallel to the northeast coast going straight up towards the Grand Banks of Newfoundland before we can cross over. Um, and so it's, it's very, quite various. <laughs> uh, this boat has also crossed the Pacific. Yeah. Uh, what's, what's the difference there? Also, how long did that take uh, leaving from Chesapeake Bay to get over to Asia? Well, it's all about uh, mileage, so we broke it up into legs. So sure. we made a plan to go to Bermuda and have a few days there. We made a plan to go to Puerto Rico and have uh, a bit of time there. And then we made a plan that takes time to go through the Panama. You got some timing there. Um, uh, and there's also the business of resupply and refuel and that sort of stuff. Distance between Panama and Hawaii is roughly 5,000 miles. So oh, wow. we were looking at you know something on the order of 25, 26 days. Um, and we've done it in, uh, maybe it's more than that, but anyway, we've done it in less. Mm -hmm. So, there's a there's a recommended route for pure sailboats whereby more often you go south of the Galapagos and then around because of the wind patterns. In the case of an auxiliary powered vessels, you can take the shortcut. Now, 
when you're in Panama, you're at the same longitude as Baltimore. You oh, haven't yeah. gone west. Yeah. You've gone south, but you haven't gone west. So you've got almost three, two and a half thousand miles to go to get to the longitude of Acapulco. Yeah. So you're in the lee of the Central Americas when you're doing that, and the and the weather is highly variable, uh, uh, and 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 can be gusty, strong, and wet, um, but it's all squalls uh, and short-lived stuff. Uh, so that's a bit of a motor sail. Sometimes you can get a lot of wind coming out of the valley that is the Tuanapec area, because the mountains of the Central Americas get broken up and you'll get high pressure in the Gulf of Mexico which will then funnel be blocked by these hills except through the valleys and you can have a, a nozzle of wind going out 100 200 miles from the shore of Central America in the area of the Gulf of Tehuantepec and you can get some heavy heavy wind it's favorable if you're in the right place if you're right. a little bit to the east it gets a little ahead if you're a little bit to the west you get a nice decent rush but it can be pretty horrible, you know, 40, 50, 60 knots of wind for a little while because of that court nozzle effect that's coming through with the high pressure over in the uh, east and, and, and pushing through the hills. Once you reach the longitude at Acapulco, now you're in the trades. Yeah. And that's a northeast um, a wind pattern. Um, and uh, we've been out that way twice, once in 94 and then once in 98. And each time, that distance between the longitude of Acapulco and Hawaii has been roughly two weeks of steady um, eight to ten knot sailing mm -hmm. with most all the sail up. Um, the seas get a bit large because of fetch. You can have a eight to ten foot sea with sometimes 12 to 15 as the trades are increasing and decreasing. Uh, and so... Uh, uh, then it's another 5,000 miles between Hawaii and China, and we were going to Shanghai, and we went in 98, which was a considerable El Nino uh, event year. So there's very little trade wind. We didn't see between, um, well, Hawaii is around latitude 20 north. Um, we intended to get down to 15 to pick up more trade, wound up getting down to nearly 10, and uh, we used a fair amount of fuel uh, with uh, judicious use of sailing and motor sailing. Mm -hmm. um, made a decision that we needed to divert to Guam. And with our satellite communication could make that known to the office. So they actually set it up and uh, we spent 10 hours in Guam. And it was fuel mm -hmm. and laundry and some, uh, a bunch of mail that got sent and ice cream. And then off we off went. went. Yeah, <laughs> and, <a> <laughs> and fortunately, the wind had picked up about three days out of Guam. So we actually sailed into Guam, and the wind continued after Guam all the way to Okinawa. And when we went on to the south, east, south, east China Sea, that's when the wind dropped out again, and we wound up motoring the rest of the way to Shanghai. I was quite relieved with the way it all worked out because we were due April 1, and I wondered if China understood April Fools. So. Yeah, that's, a, that's a, <laughs> But we didn't have that problem. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's funny. Uh, we have a, another question in from uh, Paul Halley. Uh, what's the farthest south Pride has traveled? Never, neither Pride has ever been south of the equator. Yeah. It's all been east and west. So um, uh, it would be Panama's for the south. Now, Adjacent to that, uh, the boats, uh, the old boat and the second boat, have been to Venezuela, uh, but uh, and some of the ABC islands, but not any further south than the Med uh, the Canaries and the Caribbean on, on the Atlantic side, and Guam on the Pacific side. Oh, cool. Well, uh, that does us uh, for this episode of Coffee with Captain. I want to thank all of you for uh, joining in. And thank you for those that have been donating. Uh, that helps keep this going on. And uh, Captain Miles, do you have any parting words or advice? Well, again, stay diligent. 